One of the items of mitigation is that uh, the TMT will allow the practice of Hawaiian rights or whatever, the, whichever way they say it, for four days out of the year. Would four days out of the year accommodate people who are up there doing day and night activities? Not as written, no. Throughout this contested case hearing, you keep hearing the cart before the horse. This time we have so much carts, we don't even have enough horses. And the reason why I say this is that the purpose of this required EIS has to do with the master lease. And the master lease ends in 2033. There's a still an uncertainty whether a, mass, a new master lease can be issued out. So why is the university putting forth a project? In this case, the project is the TMT Observatory, which has been clearly stated and not disputed at all in any of the testimony that it's this the lifespan of this project was 50 years or more, which would exceed the existing, what we call, it's called the master lease, but the existing general lease. If the general lease ends and there's no new lease, and technically you can't extend this general lease, all the subleases end as such. And if they end, these observatories will go through a process of decommissioning. And if the, if the TMT was built, that would apply to them as well. What is your perspective as an educator and professor of the TMT project's proposal of awarding funds for educational activities and scholarships in exchange for building this telescope? This is a blatant community bribe. I want to say a bribe. They're offering money to, 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 to destroy. And when I say it's a bribe, it's, there's strings attached to it. And so you take in the money. It's like blood money. It's, blood, it's like blood money. You take, when you talk about the scholarships, so here's the project, T, TIO is giving the money to a person, the in-between person, to support this project, scholarship money. Then a scholarship money, in most cases, is going to the UH. <laughs> it's, they've come up with a great scheme to pass money through, and it ends up back to the applicant. We've seen this with many other developments in these islands. I've seen this on many other projects that have come through how money is used in a community to buy support for a project when they know it's adverse and when they know the impacts are significant. If the TMT wasn't built and they felt it was so important that the community should have this money and should have these scholarships, then why not have the existing telescopes put in that money? We, we have 13 telescopes up there. You eliminate the UH telescopes, you'll get, if everybody paid a million dollars a year, you get somewhere between nine and $10 million. That's where you get your money from. You don't need a new telescope, $1 million a year to bribe us. Just have the existing telescopes fund, uh, fund these programs. If you felt, if the astronomy community and the existing telescopes and existing partners felt that this was so important, then they should be funding it to the extent beyond a million dollars with no strings attached because they're already there. It's as simple as that. And you also discuss the requirement to update the, the comprehensive management plan every five years. Um, and just I wanted to check if I remember correctly that somehow that update was delegated to the Office of Mauna Kea Management and that in her testimony, the executive director of the Office of Mauna Kea Management, Stephanie Nagata, said that she told the Office of Mauna Kea Management Board that there was no need to update the CMP with a new five-year analysis. And do you remember that? I remember that testimony, and well, unfortunately, Ms. Nagata does not have the authority to make those decisions. If anyone is going to determine whether a five-year 
major five-year review plan or revision is needed or not needed, that would be, have to come from the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Um, do you recall that on July 10th, 2015, the Board of Land and Natural Resources issued rules which excluded all persons from a defined restricted area between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m.? I recall those rules, but I don't recall if that's the actual date or so, but uh, I do recall the rules. And that there was an exception to the rules for astronomers or employees of a University of Hawaii facility that they could go up the mountain? Yes. Was the impact of these rules to basically exclude spiritual practitioners who practiced at night because you couldn't go up there between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m.? I don't know if it specifically excluded them, but it did exclude them as a result of these rules. The, the effect of the rules was to exclude them. Right. And then Circuit Judge Ronald Ibarra invalidated the rules based on BLNR not following the law and how they adopted the rules. You remember that? Yes. Are there written accounts describing Mauna Kea as being sacred other than those that we've seen in the record here to date? Yes, there's several accounts. I mean, it's in the UH's documents. So when Mr. Coleman came here who had no background or expertise in Hawaiian traditions and culture came up and to say that there's no accounts of being sacred, all he had to do was look in UH's own documents. It's right in their documents. It's in a FEIS document and the preface of it. It's in the CMP document. It's throughout the documents. They cite sources of why the mountain is considered sacred. And are there also many references in different documents to Mauna Kea as a burial ground? And, and there are references to Mauna Kea as being a burial ground. But you also have to understand, and this is from fam family, family accounts, that many ancestors' bones are, have been, are in the dust on the mountain. Because uh, so many of our ancestors, not all of them, of course, but some of them went up there when they knew their time was transitioning and when the time was passing. They went up to this realm. And, and as such, you won't necessarily find the remains and bones. They're in the dust of the land. Can you tell us about this photograph um, and identify it for us? What you see here in this photograph, and it was taken from Waimea by Kehaulani Marshall in March 4th of 2011, of this event that's happening. On this particular day, the entire part of the mountain above was clouded over, except for this one opening in a portal that was above it. And so when we ask for Ike Kupuna, ancestral knowledge and insight, what was shared with us is that what we see in this picture is what was happening at that time. There was these energies that were flowing through from above. Whether you believe in the concept of a, a supreme being, a creator, a god, what Hawaiians also refer to as keakua, these were life force energies from me coming from the creator, coming through this portal here. With all these observatories that have been built up there, they're causing a disturbance to the natural energy field of this mountain. And it's put things out of balance. And what does the term kupua refer to in your testimony? So kupua, spelled K-U-P-U-A, are other, other beings I don't want to say beans in a way, way, but there are other entities, there are other, and it's, and you look at the dictionary, it says supernatural beings, but it, it's more than that. It's not like a supernatural. They are in that way, but the best, so our, so our answer is a kupuna, call them kupua. There are these other beings that are there. They're not human. There are other beings that are, that, are, that are like that. And 
the comparison to a kupua who is on on a mountain is Mo'o Inania, who serves as a guardian at Lake Waiau. Right. How would you respond to individuals with a mindset or a lack of understanding who might choose to dismiss the existence of a kua, kapua, and kapuna, or dismiss them as mythological folklore or far-fetched? I'm not here to try to convince anyone on anything, on anything that we do. I can only share what we've experienced. But it would be very narrow-minded for people to believe that the human physical form is the only form of life here on this earth. There's many things beyond the physical. And I can say personally, we've encountered many things from the spirit realm in many different ways. And that our ancestors understood this very clear. That when we talk about a kua, our kua in, in a context are the natural elements. The natural elements around us. That's why our, our kupuna, our ancestors, gave them names. So it's not just the rain or the snow or the ocean and the waters. These elemental forms were the kua of, of our people. And it's not just elements. These elements have a consciousness. And when I say a consciousness, they have the ability to interact with us as humans. They have an ability to listen and receive what we have to offer in a chant or a song. And they have the ability to respond back. The best way most people are, might be familiar with is tutupele. It is many accounts of family accounts and stories that's also been written of how families and ali'i interacted with Pele. Is there any significant discussion of all of that in the CDUA? None at all. Is that your name appearing in the middle of the table on page um, 93? Yes. Do you recall being consulted or asked to consult? I don't, I don't recall being in asked well, you know, to consult. Mr. Flores, you may redirect yourself upon right. redirect. I just you answered your question. I don't recall being asked to consult. Okay, that's fine. Let me now show you a, um, a series of emails between yourself and uh, Miss uh, Michala Spearing, from, a cultural researcher for, from Cultural Surveys Hawaii. You recognize the email? And... I mean, I don't, I don't, rec I don't, re I don't recall or recognize the email. That's, if that's, that's my answer to the question. Did Thank you me. ever turn in a statement consulting on the cultural impact assessment for the TMT project? I don't, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and you don't recall this email? No, I honestly don't recall this email. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Flores, uh, do you have that picture of the uh, northern plateau? You had two pictures, one of the, uh, with no TMT observatory and one with the TMT observatory. And you were using it to refer to your opinion as to the open space characteristic. When you are evaluating the open space requirement under the rules, you are to use your award, telescoping into the northern plateau, is that correct? No. You are not? In, aren't you in this picture, Mr. Flores, taking a look at the northern plateau and only the northern plateau? Well, I'm not telescoping. I'm just providing the picture that's actually in the CDUA. Okay, so you're focusing on the northern plateau, though, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. But when you talk about the impacts to tradition and customary practices, it is your belief that we, the error that needs to be considered is the entire Mauna Kea Science Historic District. Is that correct? By law, it is correct. What law are you referring to? 
and state historic preservation law. Okay, and you, like I said, you didn't read the Kila Kila or Hale Akala decision, is that correct? Yes, I didn't read that particular and decision. You testified earlier today under oath that the statements in your written direct testimony is true and correct, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and you stand by that statement, is that correct? Yes. It says the CDOA omitted any reference to these sites, correct? Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. But in fact, the CDOA does at least identify these sites in figure 4.1. Is that correct? They're in, they're in the figure, but there's no discussion on them. Yes. Mr. Flores, you said it, and I quote, omits any reference. Is that correct? And I guess you're... In Yes, it's, yes, that's correct, okay. what's written. I'm not sure what Kila Kila decision says or not, but it may not apply because I'm not sure Haleakala is a, his, is, a, is a historic district in its entirety, but I do know the Mauna Kea Summit region is a historic district. And the reason it got its designation is because it's of its significance. And so when you're assessing any type of project, in a historic district, which the proposed TMT project proposes to be built within, you must take into consideration of the impact upon all those historic properties. The northern plateau and in that area is the only area that the, there's still open space there. Everywhere else where you turn around, there's a telescope around. That's the only place we have left. That's the only place we have left on this mountain. This is open space. This is not open space. This is not improved upon the open space. That does not preserve the open space as identified in criteria six of the eight criteria. When reports are written, the reports are written to get a favorable approval, of course. And that's why I stated that certain information is being left out. So the people who are responsible for viewing this, whether it's the OCCL staff to do a, a staff report or whether it's BNR, they're not getting the full picture of everything. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, your honor and parties here for being here in this extended time to allow me to finish testimony today and mahalo nui Professor Flores, thank you very much.